Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming along today um, to hopefully be enlightened into the world of advanced evasion techniques. Now, you may or may not be already aware of some advanced evasion techniques that have taken place or, or are actually being in use because there's a lot of advanced evasion techniques now within the press, particularly within, obviously, cybercrime. You're probably already familiar with uh, APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats, where it's a, a targeted attack against a, an organization or an individual within that organization to establish a way into that system or into that organization's network in order to compromise the data or the security that's held within there. Now, what I don't want you to do is get confused with Advanced Persistent Threats or APTs with Advanced Evasion Techniques because they're not the same, even though they're being talked about in the same sort of circles. Um, the way we see advanced evasion techniques is that they are actually um, a part of the tool set that's available to someone that is trying to perform an advanced persistent threat. So it, an AET is a tool set that's been used within an APT. So just very briefly before I dive in to the, the whole topic of, uh, of advanced evasion techniques. Just a little bit of information about Stonesoft and who they are. Um, Stonesoft are a computer security manufacturer. We provide or we manufacture uh, firewalls, intrusion prevention systems, uh, and also uh, SSL VPN remote access gateways. And quite unique within the IT security industry is that we're actually uh, a Finnish organization. So I think we are probably still the only European firewall and intrusion prevention manufacturer around. So again, it gives us quite uh, a, an interesting footprint within uh, sort of Europe and, uh, and the UK sector. We are a global organization. Um, we've been around since the early 90s. And our background was basically in resilience and making things highly available. So if you had uh, a firewall back in the early 90s and you wanted to make that highly available, you'd be using Stonesoft technology, technology called Stonebeat, in order to make that firewall highly available at that time. Now, obviously, things move on from there. And, and since the early 2000s, we've started to manufacture our own firewalls and IPS devices. Um, and since then, our, our footprint in terms of customers has, has grown. And, and we are a truly global organization now with customers, as, there, as you can see there, in, in more than 70 countries. One thing that Stonesoft is very proud of is the R&D. Um, we invest very heavily in R&D to make sure that our technologies are you know, market-leading technologies and to make sure that the, the standards within the security within our technologies are of the highest possible standards. Um, as you can see there, we have three R&D teams dedicated to Stonesoft, one in France, one in Finland, uh, and a recent addition with one in Poland. Um, and, and as I say, that's probably one of the biggest areas within Stonesoft in terms of um, staff, in terms of development, is within the R&D departments. Excuse me. So, when we're talking about IT security, no matter what organisation you are, if you're a commercial organisation, if you're financial, if you're into manufacturing, if you're an educational establishment, if you're a government organization, all of these environments all have assets that they want to protect. Um, they'll all be on different networks within that organization, but they're all ultimately assets, servers, databases, data that they want to protect and, and keep within that organization, or make sure at least that information isn't leaked out to people that shouldn't have that information. But the thing is, because we're all connected to this global internet, we can all be pretty sure that someone out there is going to want to break into our network and perhaps steal or compromise our data. Whether that's going back a few years now just to sort of gain some credibility and you know, deface a website, but more importantly these days, it's probably more to the fact that they're trying to steal some information or get personal information or gain some financial benefit from the information that they can actually take out of an organization's network. So what do we do? Well, going back now, and I know I may be simplifying things a little bit here, but going back, what we first started to do to protect our networks was to deploy a firewall. And obviously, the firewall's job is to allow out traffic that we want to allow out according to the security policy that's going to be applied to that firewall, 
So all users within our organization can access the systems, can access the data that they need to access. But at the same time, its primary function is to keep out anything that we don't want people to gain access to. So we're talking about people trying to get access to our critical systems, to our confidential data, to our users' personal information. And, you know, all in all, a firewall does a pretty good job of that. But then we realise that, well, hang on a second, we've got this firewall now and we're letting out our users gain access to the outside world. But wait a minute, we also need to get our customers, our, our users outside of our network, we need to allow them to access systems within our environment as well. So in order to do that, we need to start opening up ports on the firewall to allow access into our internal systems, whether it be database, whether it be web front end, whether it be mail systems. And by opening those ports, we're then inherently allowing data, uh, people to access the data in our systems, which means then we're presenting a, a, an access point for malicious activity in order for someone to try and get access to our systems internally. And because we open those ports, then, for example, let's say if we take a web server, I need to open up port 80 to allow people to access my web server internally. By doing so now, if my web server is vulnerable to an attack, i.e. I haven't loaded the latest security patch onto that web server, so there are known vulnerabilities against that web server, then because I've opened up port 80 through my firewall to allow access to that web server, then that web server is now vulnerable to those attacks using whatever exploits the, the attacker wants to use. So what do we do now? Well, in order to start to mitigate those risks, there are two things we can do. We can deploy what's now being labelled as, as next generation firewalls, which are still firewalls as they have been for you know, the, the, the amount of years that firewalls have been around, but they've got a little bit of extra functionality bolted to them. In fact, that they can do deep packet inspection. They can start to analyse the data payloads coming through there and not just look at the packet headers as they're trying to get through the firewall. So one option is to deploy next generation firewalls. The other option is to deploy intrusion prevention systems or intrusion detection systems. Now, the main focus for IPS or IDS now is to start to monitor and start to perform a deeper packet inspection on the data that's being allowed into my network. So I have to open up ports to allow external connectivity. Otherwise, my business, my function, whatever that is, it isn't going to last very long. So I need to open up those ports. But in doing so, I'm introducing risk. So what I can do now is that by deploying intrusion prevention systems or by deploying intrusion detection systems, I can use them now to actually examine the payload of all the packets that's coming through. So remember, the firewall's doing its job. It's blocking out the majority of the background noise that, it, that we don't want to allow in. But the data that we do allow in, the connections that we do allow in, do allow in through the firewall, it's now that, that data that we want to inspect to make sure that there isn't anything malicious or anything nasty hiding in there that's going to compromise our systems, that's going to cause denial of service attacks, or any other malicious activity. And that's what the main function of the IPS is. So if there is anything, any malicious code coming through, the IPS or the IDS system can terminate that traffic and stop that malicious data getting through to our internal systems. But then we can start to think, well, okay, well, what happens if those systems can be compromised? Because everybody thinks that by deploying IPS, by deploying firewalls with perhaps next generation technology built into them, then security administrators get this sort of cosy feeling that everything's all right. They've deployed you know, market-leading firewalls. They've deployed market-leading IPS systems. And they're assured by the vendors of those systems that these systems will give us the protection that we need and nothing malicious or, or, or um, any attacks can get through. But just start to think now about some of the recent um, events that have taken place against some high, sort of quite, you know, high-ranking organisations. Think about uh, Google, who were attacked. Turns out to be that they were attacked from a, a Chinese source. Think about RSA, uh, the, vent, the, the manufacturer of the Secure ID two-factor authentication system. 
they were attacked. Their two-factor authentication system has been compromised. Think about the likes of Sony. Thousands and thousands and thousands of personal records have been stolen from Sony. And, you know, the list goes on, and, and there's a, a growing number of high-profile organisations that are actually coming out now and saying that their systems have been compromised. So, if we go back a couple of steps there, and we think, OK, well, surely these organisations have deployed, you know, market-leading firewalls. They must have deployed intrusion prevention or intrusion detection systems. You know, these are, these are high-ranking high organizations. organisations. These are organisations that have got a lot of reputation to keep. And by allowing people to attack them and by, or, or being subjected to that sort of attack, then obviously that's going to wipe off millions of their financial status. So questions then start to be asked. Well, how do people like these organisations get compromised? What they will tell you, more, more often than not, is that either, A, well, someone brought some malicious code in from the outside. It was a, a, a virus or a worm that was installed on a, on a USB stick or on a CD drive, something like that. But basically, it was brought into the organisation, we were infected from the inside, and therefore that's how the compromise happened. Well, again, when you start to think about the, state, the, you know, the, the stature of these organisations, surely then they would have systems in place that would either disable USB ports on machines, that would you know, do the virus checking for uh, removable media. You know, so again, it's very unlikely that something like that's going to affect one of these organisations. The next thing that they'll start to say is, well, it was a configuration issue. One of our sysadmins made a mistake when they were configuring the, the security solution. They posted the, the wrong configuration to the device. It was an old configuration. Um, again, these organisations, I mean, admittedly, I know, you know, people do make mistakes, but again, there are, there are procedures put in place uh, to stop that type of thing from happening. So it starts to lead you to ask questions as to, well, how can, how can these high-profile organisations be compromised? And from the work that Stonesoft have been doing within advanced evasion techniques, we can start to see a pattern emerge now that actually says, well, hang on a second, this could possibly answer that question. Because... And I'll show you in the, in the next uh, slide, because what you're going to see right now, I'm going to show you an advanced evasion technique in action. Um, and just to briefly go over the, the, the environment that we have, um, on the left-hand side there where you can see the attack tool, that's a system called Predator that Stonesoft R&D developed internally to basically improve our own intrusion prevention and intrusion detection systems. And what it's going to do, it's going to send... An old exploit, uh, the exploit actually being used is, is Conficker. So I think everybody's aware of Conficker. It's been out for a number of years now. Um, and it's going to attempt to deliver Conficker through a market-leading IPS or next generation firewall, which is the device in the middle. And what it's going to try and do, it's going to try and compromise the target system on the other side of that IPS system or next generation firewall. And... We know, as, because this is in a, obviously in a controlled environment, we've made sure that that system is vulnerable to Conficker. Because obviously what we want to do is we want to compromise that system and prove that we can bypass the intrusion prevention device or the next generation firewall that's in place. So that's the, the, the basic schematic of the, the environment that you're going to see next. And I'll sort of give you a running commentary of what's happening in this environment. So the first thing we do in this scenario is that we, we will run the attack against the target system without any network security in place, just to show you that the, the system is vulnerable to the config or worm. So what happens is, using the predator tool, we're going to choose the config of vulnerability, and we're going to select no IPS or firewall to go through, and we're going to send it against a vulnerable Windows XP machine. We execute the attack, and down here we can see exploit succeeded, and we can then open up a command shell to prove that we've got, you know, we, we basically own that machine then. So if we can open up a command shell, we can deliver code to that device or pretty much anything we want to do. So this time what we're going to do, we're going to send that same vulnerability against the market-leading next-generation firewall. And we're not going to apply any advanced evasion techniques because we want to see that if, if without AETs, can, can this device detect it? And with it being Conficker, again, it's been around for some time now, so you'd expect 
that this market leading device should be able to detect it and there we go we can see it does the exploit fails so to prove that if we have a look at the, the management interface of this device we can see there the top entry which is on that particular entry 1442 and 46 seconds is the time frame that the, the, the attack was detected and it detected the Windows server service vulnerability but as we expected it was able to stop or detect and stop this attack taking place. So now what we're going to do is we're going to deliver that same attack again through the same security solution, but this time we're going to apply advanced evasion techniques. So here are some of the advanced evasion techniques we can use. And ultimately, we'll, we'll, we'll come into this in a little while anyway, so not, don't worry too much about what the AETs are at this point. But we're going to change the way that this packet is encoded and then transmitted across the network. So this particular attack uses a different TCP segment size. And it's going to set the segment size to 31. So we'll execute the attack again. And before, remember, this system was able to stop this attack. But now you can see, with the addition of advanced evasion techniques, the exploit now succeeds. So now when we go to our security solution and we refresh the logs... We can see, if we ref just make sure it refreshes again, just make sure it's not playing catch-up, um, there's no new entry. That's the same entry that appeared before when it was able to detect it. So very easily there, we were able to bypass that network security solution using advanced evasion techniques and, again, ultimately open the shell. Now, there are two main worrying points from that. First one, obviously, is the fact that the attack succeeded. Um, by using advanced evasion techniques. The second worrying point to there is that there was no new log entry created. Now, if you're a security administrator um, and you want to be able to identify intrusions or threats against your network, logs are your friend. They're the only piece of information sometimes that's going to indicate that something's actually happened. So if we can use an AET, or an AET, if an AET can be used to bypass security systems, but in such a way that the security system doesn't even see it as a threat, then obviously that's going to make the security professional's job 100 times harder to try and determine where the intrusion took place. Because no doubt that log was still, that a log entry would have still been generated, but it would have been generated as permitted traffic, as background noise. And if anybody's looked at firewall logs and you, and you want to go through them and, and, and you actually go through the permitted traffic logs, then good luck in trying to find something you know, malicious or that indicates an intrusion in there. So what is an evasion? Um, for evasions, what I want to do is, is, I mean, basically, let's go back to the beginning. Let's think about when TCP IP was being developed. Because I can guarantee to you that the last thing in, you know, in, in the specification for TCP IP, I'll guarantee to you that the last thing on the list there to build in was security. You know, it, was a it was a mechanism to enable different host computers to transmit messages to each other, regardless of the, the operating system being used. So security was the last thing on the development scope. And if we think about this then, over time... Different vendors, different manufacturers came together, and the RFC for TCP was created. And within that RFC for TCP, there was a general principle of robustness defined. And what I mean by that is that if I'm a device and I want to send traffic out over a TCP network, then I'm going to be conservative in the way that I transmit and encode that data. But at the same time, if I'm another TCP IP stack on that network, I'm going to be liberal in what I can receive. So that means that no, you know, no matter which type of operating system or which type of IP stack sends me the data, I should still be able to reassemble that data, pass it up through my TCP IP stack, and then deliver that into the application that, that's actually associated with it. But again, this is just one method of transmitting TCP packets across a network. And it was just one method that was agreed upon within the RFC. It doesn't mean that there isn't a million other ways to do this or different ways to transmit and encode data across the network. And that's the underlying principle of evasions. Because what an evasion wants to do is bypass your security system. And it's a classic adage, you know, as soon as we start to build defences against malicious activity, 
then the people generating the attacks get a little bit clever and start to develop ways around it. So we try to be, bolster that security again, and, and, and it's a, a constant race. Now, one of the big issues with advanced evasion techniques, and the general principle is, is that it does, it's just a different way of, transmit, or of, of encoding and transmitting the data across the network. And one of the big issues of that is, even just by doing that, doesn't mean that it's a malicious attempt. Because a lot of the ways that you transmit and or encode and transmit data are perfectly legitimate across a network. So you could start to think, well, if I'm a security vendor, then what I'll do then, and I'll just look for traffic going across my network. And if it doesn't comply 100% you know, with the RFC for TCP IP, for example, then I'll just block that traffic. But if you go along that principle, then I'll guarantee you you'll start to block legitimate traffic on that network. So it isn't just a case of looking for you know, traffic that doesn't conform to particular standards. It's a way of actually being able to, to identify that the traffic that is being sent contains malicious payload. Because an AET delivered without a payload isn't a threat. It's only when it has the malicious payload that an AET becomes that threat. Um, I don't particularly like the analogy, but I suppose it is a good one, and it's, it's there with the, with the stealth bomber. You know, a stealth bomber is designed to fly over enemy airspace undetected and deliver the payload, obviously the payload in that case being a bomb. Um, a stealth bomber without a bomb is still a stealth bomber. It's still legitimate flight, you know, it's still legitimate aircraft. It just doesn't have anything malicious in its payload. Um, and that's what an advanced evasion technique is. Now, if we start to look at the timelines for evasions and advanced evasion techniques, um, you'll probably notice, if you wanted to look at this on the, on the web, you'll probably notice that there isn't that much information out there. Uh, and that's because, um, for reasons unknown, apart from the fact that it is quite a difficult subject to tackle, a lot of security vendors have, have basically shied away from this. Um, when our R&D team started to look at this, they, they first came across some white papers from sort of the mid to late 90s that started to detail attacks that would allow people to, to bypass intrusion detection systems at the time. But again, there wasn't a lot of information on that. <coughs> As time came on, 2004, there were papers released that showed the possibility to combine different evasion techniques together. But again, there were no real attacks or threats in the wild that were, 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 be, were making use of these evasions. And by sort of 2007, there were what we class now as the, the 12 known or traditional evasion techniques. And the issue with them, as you'll see in a minute, is that although they, they were designed to bypass intrusion detection systems or intrusion prevention systems, they were particularly targeted to one particular exploit um, rather than you know, being allowed to use with multiple exploits. And, and that's when our research began. Uh, and the reason our research began was because as with any other security vendor, we submit our technologies for independent testing and approval. And one of the tests that we came, got results back from said that we were pretty poor in, in the standards of detecting evasions. So that's why our R&D and, and our chief exec at the time said basically, right, as much resource as you need, go away and look at this problem. And that's when it started. So three years later, in 2010, we decided to share the fact that we'd found something new. And we decided to share that be this because when we started to look at this problem, we discovered very quickly that, yes, there were these 12 evasions that were known about, but there were insufficient systems around to test. They were off-the-shelf commercial, off-the-shelf off the products. So what our R&D guys did was they developed their own internal testing architecture to test for different evasions, which essentially allowed us to completely create our own IP stack and then transmit and encode packets in any which way we wanted to. And as part of those initial findings, we delivered to the computer emergency response team 23 advanced evasion techniques. Now that doesn't sound a huge number again compared to the traditional 12, but the difference with these was that they were stackable. You could combine them together. So it wasn't just a single evasion being used to deliver an attack anymore. You could combine different evasions in order to try and confuse the IPS or the security device in question into thinking that the packets were actually legitimate. CERT at that point um, 
coordinated with the rest of the security community and issued out the data that we provided to them to say, okay, look, this is what you know, this is a valid threat. You know, make sure your systems can protect against this. Twelve months on, um, in well, earlier this year in February, um, we delivered a, 124 new advanced evasion techniques. So again, added to the initial 23. Just last month, we delivered a further 160 advanced evasion techniques because our research is obviously ongoing at this point. And today, where we stand today, is that there are approximately two to the power of 300 advanced evasion techniques that can be used to bypass network security systems. So you can see from that number that the way to tackle this is quite difficult because if, like a lot of the other security providers that, that we've tested against, if they try to tackle this by creating fingerprints or signatures to detect the possible combinations, then the resources required to create those fingerprints and have those fingerprints or signatures installed on their systems are absolutely huge. It becomes an almost impossible task. So there's only really one way in which we can defend against this, and I'll come on to that in a little while. So why are AETs different from what we class as the traditional or, or the standard evasion techniques? Well, first thing is that if we go back again to those, you know, the rules surrounding network communications and, and specifically around TCP IP, these, this general sort of robustness rule. And these 12 known evasions or the traditional evasions that we class them as now were pretty targeted at one level of the IP stack or they would be targeted to work with one exploit against a particular application. So, for example, uh, a vulnerability in a particular version of a web server. So, because they were so specific and because the number was quite low, they were relatively easy to stop. Where AETs are different is that we can now combine different evasions together. And we can send them simultaneously across multiple layers of the TCP IP stack. And... It isn't, they're, well, they're not designed just to um, deliver an attack using one particular exploit. You can, load multiple, you can load as many exploits in there as you like and try as many different exploits as you like. And think about from a, from a hacker or an attacker's point of view. If I'm trying to break into your network and you, know, we, 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 you go through the, the, the usual information gathering stages to try and find as much information as you can about that target system or the target network that you're trying to break into. And you think, okay, right, well, let's, you know, we'll, we'll do a port scan. But let's have a look at what's available. Even if you're clever about that, and you, know, you do the slow port scan so it isn't detected by their IPS systems. If I then try to deliver an attack against a target system that I think is vulnerable to this particular exploit, but their network security system detects that attack, then that's it, game over for me. I can't do anything further because now my IP address or my attack vector has been blocked and I can't go any further. So if we now think about it, though, in terms of an advanced evasion technique, if I can deliver an exploit through this IPS or this next generation firewall or uh, via an IDS system and the exploit isn't detected, Okay, it doesn't matter that the exploit doesn't work against the target system. The target system might be patched against this particular vulnerability. But what it does give me then is the opportunity to try a different exploit because I haven't been detected. So I can now load in a different exploit and try again and again and again. And I can keep trying until I find an exploit that works against the particular system I'm trying to target. Because again, whatever security is in place is being completely bypassed or, or basically rendered ineffective by the use of advanced evasion techniques. So here's a, 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 an example of one such evasion technique. Um, the RFC for TCP stipulates that if I'm a client and I'm trying to make a connection to a target system, <coughs> then there must be a specific time wait delay before I can use the same source port number again that I've just used within the initial connection. So one particular type of attack would be to, first of all, open and close a TCP connection to a target system. But obviously, don't have any malicious data in there, don't have the attack loaded in there. But then, as soon as that, system, that connection's closed, open up a new TCP connection but using the same TCP source port. 
Because what that will do, and we can do this if we can use our own IP stack, is it will fool the IPS into thinking that the connection has already been checked, there was nothing malicious in there, so it will pass it straight through because it sees it as an existing connection. So, and it says, well, as it says at the bottom there, the IPS should handle any new connection as a new connection, regardless of the time wait delay or the state that it's in. But what we find is that most IPS systems on the market won't do that. And the reason they don't do that is because they, not necessarily, again, it depends on the performance. A lot of organizations, when they place IPS on the network, don't want them to cause a bottleneck. They don't want it to cause latency. So a lot of vendors start to produce their security systems that will technically sacrifice the security in favor of performance. So this is one type of attack, then, that would be successful against this type of security system. Another way of doing this is within an MSRPC type of version. So we're using you know, Microsoft's remote procedure call system. Again, the client can change the current context using the alter context method. So first of all, the client binds to a context that isn't vulnerable. So the IPS system records that as a clean session but then immediately changes that context into a vulnerable context and delivers the exploit. Again, fools the IPS into thinking that this, the, the connection itself is legitimate. And there's nothing wrong with it. So just, these are just two of, of again, uh, this, this, you know, this two to the power of 300 possible combinations. So, um, but what it essentially means is, though, is that now someone with the resources can actually encode and then transmit data pretty much in any method that, or in any way that they like or in any combination they like. So it allows them to deliver those exploits against target systems, but against, you know, by completely bypassing these security platforms. So one of the obvious responses to this is that, well, hang on a second. Well, may, you know, we, we've got some market-leading technology on our network, so surely... Um, my firewall, my IPS, my next-gen firewall, my UTM device can stop these attacks. They can detect them. Well, as you saw in the earlier video there, um, we were under that impression as well. And when we first discovered AETs and we tested them against our own intrusion prevention system, we were able to blow holes right the way through our own technology as well. And it was at that point we thought, well, hang on a second, we're either doing something completely wrong here or this is a bigger problem than we first thought. So at that point, we decided to go out and we purchased the majority of our competitors' equipment. Um, if you're familiar with the Gartner Magic Quadrant, it's uh, um, an analyst's tool, basically, that will show you the abilities of particular network security solutions. Um, it's broken up into four quarters where we have niche players, leaders, challengers, and, and visionaries. And what we did was we took all of the devices, or all of the highest ranked security devices out of there. And so the likes of Checkpoint, the likes of Cisco, the likes of McAfee, um, Tipping Point, Sourcefire. And we purchased all of these devices and we've put them in our test lab. And we're running our advanced evasion techniques using our predator system basically 24-7 against these to try and find out which ones are vulnerable to whichever attack. And I can still say of today that every single device that we've tested against is vulnerable to an advanced evasion technique. Um, not necessarily every advanced evasion technique works, nor does every combination of advanced evasion technique work, but advanced evasion techniques of some combination or another will work against every single device. So then we start to get into the, well, well, okay, then how can we defend against them? And the one thing I, I, I try not to well, instill is that I, it isn't all doom and gloom. It isn't the fact that, you know, every network in the world tomorrow is going to be hacked and everybody's going to get broken into. Um, you know, it isn't the case. But what is the case, though, is that these things can actually be stopped by using simple measures. Um, if you think about why we deploy security, why we deploy firewalls, why we deploy intrusion prevention systems. 
we do that the, for the majority of the time. Yes, to keep out the background noise, to allow, you know, to restrict our connections in and out of our, our networks as much as possible. But also, as a sysadmin, it gives us time to deploy security patches internally against our systems. Let's take you know, Microsoft as an example. We have a Microsoft system running. Uh, we have a production application working on there. And Tuesday comes along and there's a new security patch for that Microsoft operating system. So what do we do? Do we deploy the patch straight away? Not likely. You know, we want to test that patch first. Because if we deploy that patch straight away on our production system, then there is a good chance that it could stop our production system from working. So what we want to do is test it in a controlled environment, which means we're actually leaving our, predict our production system open to the new attacks that this, this new security patch is, is designed to fix. So that's why we have our firewalls and our IPS systems, because that gives us the time, almost like a virtual patching zone, to, to stop these new attacks coming through, giving us time to deploy the fixes. And that's where the cover the basics comes in, because the first and easiest way to stop this is to make sure that our systems are patched. Um, if the vulnerability isn't open, then it doesn't matter how many AETs are used or how many exploits are sent through. If the system isn't vulnerable to that exploit, it's never going to be compromised. So patching is number one on the list of things to do to, in order to, to sort of defend against advanced evasion techniques. But also other basics. Um, I've got permissions on there. And again, that's a classic one within any organisation. What you tend to find is that when systems are, pl are, are put into place, They'll tend to be put into place with um, either default or easy to remember passwords so that the people that are deploying them can remember them quickly in order to make sure that they're working for everybody else to use. However, unfortunately what tends to happen is that those passwords, whether the default ones or the easy to remember ones, get left in place. So therefore, as the system grows organically, then the passwords remain in place um, and therefore they're easy to guess. And, and that was a, a, another good example um, probably about two or three years ago now against Twitter. One of the early administrators of Twitter um, had a, a very easy to guess password as part of his, because he was part of the initial build on that system. Uh, and his, his account was compromised and then obviously therefore he, the, the attackers could compromise other accounts and, and so on. But again, it's checking things like permissions to systems. You know, make sure people that are using them systems only have access to the data that they require. Otherwise, if you've got open access, then obviously if somebody compromises it, they've got access to everything as well. Um, know your assets. Again, this is one of the key things, and you'd be surprised at how many organizations don't know about all of the systems that are in place on the network. Um, I've been into countless organizations doing audits and such where we're trying to re-architect the network but obviously, in order to do that, we need to understand what's on there in the first place. And you know, we, we found servers running Windows NT Server. And you'll go to the, 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 the network security or the IT manager, and you'll say, OK, what's that server for? And they'll look at you blankly. But the problem is, it's probably performing some really important function within the organization. It's just been forgotten about. So again, if you don't know what you have on your network, you can never secure it. So it's the whole, the whole idea of knowing the assets know who accesses them, why they access them, uh, when they need to access them, and, and where they need to access them from. Because again, that allows you to build a security policy to put in place to, to enhance the security for that particular system. The next one there about being vigilant. Um, again, this comes down to the systems being able to monitor correctly. You know, if you don't monitor the logs that are being used or the, the, for the security systems or the applications that are using, then you're not going to know if any intrusions have taken place. Um, admittedly, if advanced evasion techniques are being used, then obviously it's difficult to monitor something that it can't detect. But again, if you're looking for patterns, if you're looking for anomalous activity, um, you know, slightly diff you know, different behavior in network traffic, then again, it all points to something that might be an intrusion. Um, this one, or the second one, or the, the next one, sorry, the deploy advanced evasion ready network security. When it comes to detecting advanced evasion techniques, if we you know, if refer back to what I said earlier on, um, advanced evasion techniques on their own aren't necessarily a threat. 
obviously it's the payload that's the threat. So just by looking for traffic that doesn't conform to standards doesn't mean you're detecting and blocking threats. The only way to successfully detect if there's something malicious taking place with an advanced evasion technique is for the security solution to do what we call normalization. And what I mean by that is, as the packets are coming through the network security device, that security solution should be able to reassemble those packets in exactly the same way that the target system would. So remember about the, the liberal receiving of traffic. So if our IPS system can then reassemble the data as it comes through to see it in, in exactly the same way that the target system would see it, then it's just a standard network packet. Standard fingerprint signature detections would detect the payload that's in use. It doesn't matter how that packet's been crafted or transmitted because we've rebuilt the packet as, it's been, as it should be seen. And, and that's the really only effective way to defend against advanced evasion techniques. But unfortunately, what we've seen so far as an organization is that the majority of security providers out there aren't doing anything like that. They're trying to rely on fingerprints or they've gone for the performance angle. And, and the, the issue with the performance angle is that they don't have enough resource on the device to, to do the reassembly. You know, you've only got a certain time frame in there or a certain window where you can keep a, a sufficient data in order to do that reassembly before it's, it's on and it's gone through the network. So if the device doesn't have enough resource to do that, then it's impossible to detect um, a, a, an exploit within an advanced evasion technique. And you know, it isn't a case of deploying these devices everywhere. You put them at critical or key locations. And at least then you're giving yourself this your classic defense in depth. And the last point on there is, is, is review. Don't be impatient, or don't be complacent even. Um, what you tend to find, and again, it's coming back to this sort of false level of security, because you know, I, 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 as a security administrator, I've deployed firewalls, I've deployed IPS, IDS technologies, I'm protected. So you don't necessarily tend to look at those logs again as regularly as you should, or, or notice the alerts that are taking place. You assume that the systems are protected. So review, don't be complacent. Now, what I tend to say at this point, obviously, is that you know, AETs, they are relatively new in terms of network security and, and, and ways of going through there, and, and I don't expect anyone just to take my word for this. Um, but the way Stonesoft approached this is that when the R&D guys discovered this and we, we thoroughly tested, um, what we decided to do was go down the sort of due care, due diligence route and shared our findings with the security community. Now, by doing that, we've opened ourselves up to, you know, obvious, uh, let's say, criticism. Um, a lot of other vendors basically just turned around and said, this is just marketing. Uh, it's trying to expose fear and debt, uncertainty and doubt. Um, but also by sharing our findings, we've basically had independent verification. So the computer emergency response team have looked at our findings, they've studied it, and they've validated it as a threat. We've also had the likes of... NSS labs and ICSA labs, who are independent testing houses. They've looked at the data. They've even tested these advanced evasion techniques attacks against their own equipment, so not just the equipment in our laboratories. So we know that we can bypass every vendor's security device. Just to summarize here, uh, advanced evasion techniques are real, and they are in use. Um, we're doing a lot of sort of coordinated research now um, with the likes of BT uh, and also the University of Glamorgan are looking at this as well. And we're hopefully bringing out, or we will be publishing some new white papers very soon um, where these have been seen in the wild and being used against, against organisations, networks. But one of the key things to remember as well as this is that an advanced evasion technique is not an exploit. You know, it isn't the conficker worm, it isn't a new NIMDA virus or anything like that. It's a delivery mechanism. And it's a delivery mechanism that is used to deliver exploits through security solutions. So that's one, another general mistake that people tend to see is that, oh, it's just another virus, you know, uh, it's another worm, my, my AV solution will detect it. It isn't going to happen because it's nothing to do with that. It's the way that packets are in, uh, transmitted and encoded. And again, unfortunately... Stonesoft seems to be the only vendor taking this threat seriously at the moment. And it is a big problem because as an organization, uh, as an entity that wants to deploy security to protect their assets, 
it's always great to see you know the latest sort of uh, bells and whistles on technologies that make it look shiny and cool and, and, and it does this fantastic thing and it has really cool flashing lights on it. Um, the problem is, if they're not doing the fundamentals right and actually reading the network traffic as it should be read, then it doesn't matter how many bells and whistles that has, it's going to get bypassed. So it's about coming back to the fundamentals and taking things seriously. 80s won't go away. Um, a lot of vendors wish that they would because it is a difficult problem to tackle. But they won't. And again, they're being used more and more. But the good news is, is that we can defend against them. It isn't all doom and gloom. We can put you know, simple procedures in place that can stop them. And you know, as Stonesoft have found, you know, we, we're now developing technologies that can also defend against them. And hopefully, the rest of the security community will catch up as well. So there are my contact details. If anybody wants to request further information at a later date, that's absolutely fine. So at that point, I'd just say thanks for your time this evening. Uh, and if there are any questions, then please feel free.